This property is one of our more challenging areas of the state for establishing windbreaks, but they're very much needed due to the high elevations, the short season, and our tremendous winds that come through this area. We'll now join the folks from the Laramie Rivers Conservation District as they um, go about planting a new section of this windbreak. Hello, my name is Martin Curry. I'm with Laramie River Conservation District. Today, we're out here getting ready to plant a living snow fence that is three rows. Last fall, we were at the site and we ripped it to a depth of three feet. Today, we started off with rototilling to a depth of six inches, and then we laid the weed barrier. After digging the trench, they placed the weed barrier fabric in the bottom of the trench, utilizing staples to pin it down. They then refill the trench with dirt to hold the end down and utilize their tractor to spread the weed barrier and to cover up the sides to hold the weed barrier in place and keep it from being torn up by the winds. Uh, the reason we use the weed barrier study has shown that by using weed barrier in our living snow fences we can eliminate the competition from grass as well as pre conserve moisture and heats up the ground which extends our growing period for these trees. Today we're going to be planting a three row windbreak it's going to consist of a shrub row, a deciduous row, and an evergreen row. The first row that we're going to be planting today will be the carrigana row. That'll be our shrub row. Uh, it'll consist of shrubs planted four feet apart, and those shrubs are also yearlings, one-year-old shrubs. The middle row is going to be a row of evergreen ponderosa pine and we're going to plant them at 15 foot apart. And then the third row is going to consist of Canadian choke cherries. Those will be planted 12 feet apart. And those are deciduous trees. That hints the difference in distance between them is to give them room to grow up. At this particular site, the landowner has elected to erect a four foot picket fence on the windward side of his tree row to protect his trees until they get a chance to get established and then he'll remove the picket fence. After the weed barrier fabric is laid down, they use a utility knife to make an X where each tree will be planted. They then go along and dig out the area where the tree is going to go. techniques to consider when you're planting these shrubs is when you get these roots that are kind of long you can go ahead and trim them just a little it doesn't hurt them and another thing that you want to do when you plant these is make sure that you get the roots pointed down you don't want them turning up which we would call a j-hook the reason for that is when these are turned up they'll continue to grow and hit the air or the soil surface and that kills the shrubs so always try to keep your roots pointing down when you're planting them And another technique while planting these is make sure that you compact the soil as you're coming up. One, another thing that will kill these shrubs is air pockets in the soil. When them roots grow out and hit air pockets it kills them. So we want to try to get all the air pockets out of the hole when you're planting them. I'd like to discuss the irrigation system that we're going to be using for this drip system on the tree planting. First thing you're going to need is a supply line, it's usually a three quarter inch supply, and that can come from a frost proof hydrant or it can come from a tap off of a house. We'll tie into that. The first thing you're going to need in the system is this guy. This is what we call a backflow preventer. And that's going to prevent the water from coming backwards into our well and contaminating our well. The next piece that's critical in the system is this guy. This is a pressure reducer, Y strainer, all combined. Uh, the Y strainer part of it is this guy. We have that in place to prevent our emitters from being plugged up. And the reducing part of it is to reduce the supply pressure which is typically 50 pounds per square inch down to 20 pounds per square inch and that is to prevent our emitters from being blowed out. After you've completely assembled 
the regulator in the backflow assembly, you attach it to the three quarter inch line, you're going to run that three quarter inch line perpendicular at the head of your rows to include all the rows. And then you're going to cut in these T's to branch off to each individual row. You're going to come down to a three quarter inch valve so you can regulate each row individually. And then you're going to install a three quarter inch half inch reducer. Okay, after you get the supply side run to the head of the rows, we're going to reduce that down to half inch, and that's what's going to run down the, the full extent of the row. This is the half inch tubing. It comes in a roll of 500 feet. Um, it is high quality for UV reasons. Um, these systems will lay out here in the sun, and they're going to take a lot of punishment, so I recommend a high quality tubing. After you've pulled your drips or the half inch line to the end of the row, we're going to start at the back of the row and work our way back up to the supply line. We're going to serpentine the pipe on top of the fabric and then we're going to hold it in place with these six inch pins. The reason for the serpentine is to allow for expansion and contraction of the water or the pipeline. And another reason for using these pins to hold it in place is to keep the wildlife from dragging it off of location. Okay, the main part of the drip system is this little guy. These are our emitters. They look just like that. They're barbed on one end, so when you stick it into the pipe, it sticks. And then this is where the water drips out on the other end. Depending on what product of emitter you're using, you're going to have to purchase a tool to install them. Different products will have different tools, so make sure that the tool matches the product that you're using. The technique for installing the emitters is you just take and stick the emitter in the tool, grab behind the pipe, and just punch it in. After you've completely installed all the emitters, the final step of getting your drip system operational is to turn on the water, wait till you get a flush out of the end of your lines, and then you can go ahead and install any end cap that you plan on putting on these systems. So what we use is a figure eight. This is one of multiple products that are on the market that can be used. So all you have to do is just slide it over the pipe, fold the pipe back onto itself, and then slide the other eight on. After you got the drip system installed and then operational, go ahead and check all the emitters to make sure that they're functioning properly. And then you're going to want to give these newly planted seedlings a pretty good soaking, I would say three hours, possibly four hours of watering. After that, your watering schedule is going to depend on the type of soils and the climate and where the tree planting is sited. Maintenance is an important issue on the drip system and the living snow fences and the survivability of the trees. It is important to periodically check the emitters to make sure that they are properly functioning as well as to check all your strainers to make sure that they're clean. Make sure that your regulator system is working and with that you should have a successful tree planting. As you've seen today is one method of planting living snow fences. There are various methods in which this can be done. If this is something that you are interested in, planting a shelter belt or a living snow fence on your property, please check with your local conservation district or your NRCS representatives. They can help you with the planting phase and in some districts may even be able to help you get the planting going.